Hi Chabad Glenara and Shalom Lakola Israelim Bachabad Glenara. My name is Justin Fulop, and for those that don't know me, I'm Ron Fulop's son. If you don't know him, he's the grey haired dentist who sits at the front table at Shul, so hopefully that creates a picture already. Um, I'm 22 years old. I'm currently in my second year of my university degree, and I just finished this last year my army service in the IDF. Um, I'm going to explain to you now some of my experiences in the army and why I chose to enlist. People would come up to me and say, Justin, you're crazy. I can't believe you can leave everything here, your family, your friends, this and that, and go to a foreign country and fight for the army and put your life on the line. But for me at the time, when I drafted, I felt like it would have been more difficult for me to stay in Australia knowing that my heart was there and that I could be the best version of myself over there in the army. Um, there are a few reasons for this. Um, first is education. I went to Mount Scopus College from kinder until year 12, my whole schooling life. Very Zionist school, Zionist camps in year 9 and 10, all pun. We went to Israel for five weeks in year 10 and that really um, strengthened my connection with the country. Also a big thing is, is uh, Shul. Chabad Glenaira, Mendy and Moish instilled in me a love for the Jewish people in um, Israel. And from a young age, I went from when I was probably two, and I still go now. So it's amazing how much in influence they had on me as well. Um, another reason why, another factor why is the Holocaust and my family. My family is a very Jewish family, very traditional family, Zionist family, and also I'm descendant of Holocaust survivors on both my mum's and my dad's side from from Hungary. They came up in the 1950s after the Holocaust, and I think growing up in the shadow where my dad didn't grow up with uncles and aunties, really, I learned from that what the consequences of, of not having a country or not having an army to defend your people is, and I think growing up with that in mind really pushed me to do what I did. Um, and lastly, we we pray three times a day, Shachrit, Mincha, and Mariv, to return and to rebuild Jerusalem. And for the first time in 2,000 years, we have a chance to actually go back. They say, you can go back. We, it, we, we don't have to fight to go back. We can just take a plane. We can just take a plane right there, and we're there, and we can take a part in active Jewish history. I didn't, want it to be, I didn't want to be on the sidelines, I wanted to be on the front lines and writing my own version and my own page in the history of the Jewish people and I thought I was only capable of doing it there. So yeah, that's a big thing. So in March of 2018 I drafted to the army, to the Nachal Brigade, to Gdud, to Gdud Chamishim, for, for those that know, with the green beret and the red boots, and I drafted into combat and it was an incredible amazing hard tough experience which i'm very glad I, I did and i just wanted to share a few a few stories now the training went for eight months basic trainings four months advanced training is another four months and it would be normal for me to come home with bruises on both of my legs when we had a week to try out when i shot my new gun the the negev i was the negevist in my class i've got the big machine gun and it can shoot um, drums goes brrr, and it's just crazy gun and I was l lucky enough to receive that tough kid in the training week I actually took photos of my leg and it was just bruised and black throughout the whole leg so that was crazy and doing masa art and marches for 40k for for, for 50k with 40% of your body weight with a stretcher with a guy on the stretcher the whole night was crazy stuff too um a few stories one um there was a lone soldier in my plugger from Los Angeles and lone soldiers, I was considered a lone soldier. We get a month off a year to go home and visit our family. So in February of 2019, I went home and this particular soldier was meant to go home to, to Los Angeles the day, up, the day after me. But it turns out when I landed in Australia, I, I found out that he was on a patrol of the Gaza border we were based on the Gaza border for five months at that time and they drove over a mine 
and shrapnel went into his throat, nearly nearly killing him. He was a millimeter or two away from actually dying. And that really put into perspective everything and the fact that he was supposed to be home. But in fact, his family from the States had to come and visit him in a hospital in, in Israel was well, just a shock. I was also on the Gaza border when all the rockets in 2019 were coming on Israeli towns and kibbutzim and, and the cities down south. And we were told we're going to war. So we had to, pa we had to pack our bags for war. We had to shine our guns. We had to polish this, make trail magazines, write contact family. And you didn't really have time to stress or think about it because if you had time to think, you would just get scared and you wouldn't have time to actually... Yeah, just the... Uh, the adrenaline rush there was pushing you too hard that you didn't really have time to stress or things, so that was crazy. And also standing for the minutes silence on Yoma Shoa and Yoma Zikaron was were very meaningful times. Me in a uniform of a Jewish army and a state protecting ourselves, showing that this will never happen again. We will never let this happen again. Was a very meaningful moment in my life too. Um, yeah, so I just. I wanted to share that with you. I hope you have a good Shabbos and hopefully I'll see you guys soon. Bye. Good evening, everybody. I'm Candace and I will be showing you how to make a traditional South African cheesecake just in time for Shabbos. Firstly, get yourself a glass of wine and enjoy. Lachayim. Let's start off by preheating your oven to 180 degrees. Okay, the ingredients that you're going to be needing is 250 grams of any plain biscuit. In this case, I've used caramel flavored. Okay, then you're going to need 500 grams of reduced fat cream cheese, one cup of caster sugar, 200 ml of full cream, 6 eggs separated, 250 grams of melted butter, and 250 grams of plain cream cheese. is to take your biscuits and crush them in your food processor. Okay, now we combine the butter with the crushed biscuits. Okay, so once it's combined, place it into your baking tray and make sure that you've pressed it firmly down onto the bottom. Okay, the next step is to take your six egg yolks and beat them until they are light and fluffy. When the eggs look light and fluffy like this, it's now time to put in half of the low fat cream cheese. And 
now we add in the other half of the cream cheese, the full fat cream cheese. Okay, so now the next step is to add the rest of the remaining full fat cream cheese. Okay, so finally we add the last of our remaining low fat cream cheese. And it's important that you beat it until there are no lumps, until you get a very smooth consistency. Slowly add the cream until there are no lumps and you get a smooth consistency. Okay. Now what you have to do is put all your egg whites into a separate bowl and whisk them until soft peaks form. So it should look something similar to that, with your soft peaks. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to take our soft peaks of whites and fold it one third at a time into the cream cheese mixture. In. Okay, so we just fold it in until it's all combined. Okay, so I'm just about finished folding it all in and it starts looking very smooth. Okay, and the last step is to pour it over the, your biscuit base. So there we go, pour it all in. Okay. Make it smooth, like that. Just wait, wait. Okay, so we put it into our preheated oven and bake it at 180 for 50 minutes until the cheesecake is cooked but it's still a bit wobbly. Okay, so that's 50 minutes. We take a cake out. Okay. All a bit wobbly in the middle. Okay. Okay, and that's it, people. So I hope you enjoy your cheesecake. Enjoy your shovel oat. Hugs and Maya. Parshas Bamidbar. Hello. The Talmud reports that the generation of Yehuda Bar Eli represented Torah study at its best. What was so striking about this generation? The Talmud says that in this period, six people would study together under a single blanket. On one level, the Talmud means that despite having only one blanket due to harsh circumstances and poverty, the people were still devoted to Torah study. Rabbi Chaim Shmulevich, however, offers another explanation. The only way six people sat together under one blanket was if everyone was looking out for each other and making sure that all are covered. The true greatness of Rabbi Yehuda Bar Eli's generation could be found in the way they loved and respected each other. A similar idea is expressed in the Torah itself regarding the revelation at Har Sinai. The Torah describes how the Jewish people were so unified at that time of the revelation that it was this one person stood at Har Sinai. It was precisely because of this unity that we were worthy of receiving God's law. The theme plays a pivotal role in this week's Torah portion by Midbar. The Pasha goes to great lengths to describe the Israelite encampment in the desert. In the middle of the camp were the Levites and the sanctuary. Surrounding this center were the 12 tribes creating an overall shape of a square. There were three tribes to each of the four sides of the square, north, south, east and west, constitu con constituting secondary encampments. Accompanying each tribe was a flag 
which had the tribe's particular insignia upon it. The colours of the flags were patterned after the colours of the stones on the Koyan Kodal's breastplate, each of which represented a different tribe. The Midrash says that when God suggested this arrangement, Moshe questioned the idea, saying, Now there will be disputes between the tribes. Moses reasoned <coughs> that once he starts specifying who travels in the east and who travels in the west, who is in front and who is in back, people are going to start arguing. Moreover, each of the different directions of the compass is associated with a different quality and blessing. The north, for instance, is associated with wealth and the south with wisdom. God explained to Moshe that there was no need for concern. The tribes would accept the encampment arrangements for a simple reason. Years earlier, at Yaakov's funeral, his 12 sons carried the coffin. The way the sons were arranged around the coffin is the same way the tribes would be arranged in the desert camp. In this way, everyone would already be clear as to their proper place. So don't worry, Hashem tells Moshe, because when someone knows their place, there is inevitably peace and calm. And so it is. In our Pasha, the long description of who will travel first, who will travel last, the Torah says, and the Jewish people did exactly as they were instructed. Love and respect for each individual and a recognition of how each contributes to the whole is the way for the Jewish nation to achieve true greatness. May this be so speedily in our days. Bimhara be amenu amen. Good Shabbos. The yard sites for the upcoming week, uh, Warren Bafsky for his father, Ida Klappish for her mother, Craig Levin for his father, Lina Leibowitz for his brother, Martin Omsky for his grandmother, Jack and Mary New for their daughter, Vera Berger for her father, Janet Rudniansky for her father. We wish you all long life. For the upcoming uh, Jewish birthdays for next week, uh, David Artenstein, Michal Etzion, Seth Greenblatt, Paul Gerblum, Brittany Milstein, Grace Moskovic, and Jesse Peer, and Shira Smith. We wish you all a happy Jewish birthday. This week's Torah portion, named Bamidbar, which means desert, is always read in the Shabbat before Shavuot, when we celebrate the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai in the year 1313 BCE. The reason being is because the Torah was given in Bamidbar in a desert, as we all know. But that begs a question. Why from all places would God give us the Torah in a barren wilderness. You know, the sages explain that the Sinai was like a marriage between God and his people. Whoever heard of getting married in a barren desert? We should have got, we get married in the Hilton, the world of Astoria, not in a barren desert. And there's another question. Why was it so necessary for the Jews to wander in the desert for 40 years? It wasn't 210 years in Egypt? including over 117 years of hard labor enough? There are, three there are many explanations uh, to this. I will share with you three. The first explanation is, if the Torah would have been given to a specific civilization, a community, a culture, then people would associate the Torah with a specific civilization, culture, and community. It would have been put into perspective. Sophisticated academics would have enlightened us uh, and explained how the Torah belongs to a certain period of time, a certain culture, a certain civilization. Uh, the, the Torah would have been labeled, classified, and qualified. But in truth, the Torah cannot be put into any specific culture 
or civilization. The Torah is not an art, is not a culture, it is not law or history. Torah speaks eternal truths about existence and about life that speak in every language, in every culture, in every age, to every single soul. As Professor Abraham Joshua Heschel puts it, and I quote the following, Why does the Bible surpass everything created by man? Why is there no work worthy of, its, of comparison with it? Why is there no substitute for the Bible, no parallel to the history it has engendered? Why must all who seek the living God turn to its pages? Set the Bible aside any of the truly great books produced by the genius of man and see how they are diminished in, the, in, the, in stature. The Bible shows no concern with literary form, with verbal beauty, and its absolute sublimity rings through all its pages. Its lines are so monumental and at the same time so simple that whoever tries to compete with them produces either a commentary or a distortion. It is a work we do not know how to assess. Other books you can estimate, you can measure, compare. The Bible you can only extol. Its insights surpass our standards. There is nothing greater. In 3,000 years it has not aged a day. It is a book that cannot die. Oblivion shuns its pages. So therefore, such a work must be taught and transmi transmitted in a desert where there is no civilization, no community, no culture, because the Torah is beyond that. The second explanation is, if the Torah would have been given to a specific community, or city or civilization, the inhabitants of that community civilization would have claimed copyrights over it. They would say, imagine if the Torah would be given in Borough Park and Crown Heights and Williamsburg and Monsey. They would say, the Torah belongs to us. We understand it. We can interpret it. We can assess it. That's why the Torah was given in the desert. The desert belongs to nobody. It's ownerless. Similarly, the Torah is ownerless. It is, belongs to every single Jewish soul. No one has rights over the Torah. The third explanation is, if the Torah would have been given in a civilized place and a splendid terrain, people might have believed that the Torah is a guide for the splendid heart and for the beautiful life. But that is not Torah. Torah does not say that life is easy and faith is bliss. We have been put in a spiritual, personal, and global wilderness, and life is a battle. And precisely this battle is what God wants us to face. Therefore, we should not be discouraged by our personal desert, our weaknesses, our challenges, our inconsistencies. We shouldn't be disturbed by the spiritual wilderness that surround us. Because precisely this is what the Torah was given to us, to pave a road in the barren desert of the human psyche and to create a highway in the jungle of history. Have a wonderful Shabbat.